I'd rather create something that others criticize than create nothing and criticize others. If you have high quality product behind the bar, it's like a weapon. It's not about the figures. It's about who those figures are. The Hospopreneurs Podcast. I'm going to drink this beer. Yeah, let's crack it. With James Henderson. Hello and welcome to episode 86 of the Hospopreneurs Podcast. Joe Grubak has worked in kitchens across Melbourne and London, heading up some and stepping back to learn and grow in others. He's worked for industry greats like Gordon Ramsay at the three Michelin starred Hospital Road in Chelsea and then The Square in Mayfair, where he rose to a sous chef role under Philip Howard. Back in Melbourne, Joe worked with Jacques Raymond, George Kalambaris and then Scott Pickett to open the critically acclaimed St. Crispin before embarking on a solo adventure with Sax in 2017. From watching his mom roll gnocchi on Sundays to ultimately developing a unique flavor and style of cooking, Joe's seen the culinary world from many perspectives and it's a pleasure to share our creative discussion together. Hello and welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you for having me. Joe, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on today. As you know, the first question I like to ask is, what is your crazy hospitality story? My gosh, in 20 years of cooking, I've got loads. Where do you want me to start? 18, 20 years ago in an Italian restaurant, Lonsdale Street, Marchetti's Latin. It was a two-hat restaurant where I was definitely there, but I don't think I played a part in it, but there was an apprentice trying to walk out the back with a lobster tied to a string. And okay. Yes. <laughs> Someone in the kitchen asked him, can you take the lobster around the block for some exercise? And then proceeded to tell him. So it was rather cruel for both the lobster and wow. the apprentice. So make sure that lobster's fit for service. Fit for consumption, yes. fit for service, fit to go the mile, I think, really. <laughs> yes, I like that. Thank you very much for a quick little story there, Joe. I do like to ask next why you do what you do. For me, cooking is about, and, you know, it's nearly a gift and I guess that the greatest thing that I love doing and it's kind of a bit of a secret guilty pleasure if you would but from the creation of the dish to the cooking of it to the plating of it and then it goes out to a table and you see a plate go down in front of someone you see their face light up to me that is why I do what I do to have that instant recognition of a smile on the face and to go wow look at this this looks amazing and then they kind of get into it so yeah I think cooking is very personal and that's why I do it. What is it that stimulates that reaction in a guest? It's always love at first sight, if you would. I guess that appearance of the dish, colors, textures, flavors, and then obviously moving past that once they then put it in their mouth. And sometimes I've even known to see someone put something in their mouth and they close their eyes. And that amazing point where you're eating something and you just, you block out the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. To isolate that amazing flavor or texture, it's something that I know I do. I definitely don't eat as much of what I cook, but things like wild truffles that can't be reproduced. Again, something that I love, and I think when you have one that's amazing, it's just like, I don't want any disruptions. I just want to enjoy this. That's it. This industry is very experiential. Obviously, there are a lot of those factors at play in a space. How do you consider all of those things and the interplay between them when establishing an environment for guests? I think the ambience and the fit out of the space is part and parcel of the food that you're delivering, the service that you're delivering. For example, you you know, you can't have a Mexican fit out and then do Italian food. I think it is an amazing part of it. And also for me, like music is a big part of life. I've always believed, even when I was at St. Crispin, music is life. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling this, you listen to this, or when you're feeling happy, you listen to this. It's part of us, and I think somewhat we like to eat and drink similarly. So yeah, I think that is definitely part of it, and if we don't have elevator music here at Sax. And again, sometimes you look up deep in the middle of service, and you'll see a table bopping along to a song that's playing that potentially it could have been part of their childhood or teen years or whatever. How do you select that music then? How do you know it's appropriate to the demographic that's coming in? You don't always always. Generally, it is quite specific to an era or a taste, 80s, 90s, that kind of stuff. So you can't always hit the right note. And sometimes, not very often, but sometimes we do have people who say, you know, can you turn the music down? And again, sometimes it's the one thing that I believe it's part of the environment. I'm totally on the same page, obviously, as a podcaster and musician myself. Audio is 
paramount in the yes. experience. Does it change with the menu for you? Do you curate that playlist based on any other factors? Not really, no. So my wife looks after all of the playlists and look, there's some that are still on there from St. Christmas days. There are definitely some new ones. They kind of vary, come in, change a bit. And it's up to the staff as well sometimes to play what they feel like playing. There's probably about 50 different playlists there and we've got a really noisy, busy service tonight. So yeah, let's play some rap or let's play some upbeat stuff or more potentially for lunch where we have business lunches and meetings and more suited kind of thing it's probably a little bit more laid back joe how do you define what you do i think it's multifaceted i think it's an exhibitionist sometimes i think it's definitely an artist i think it's definitely creative mind i think it's definitely uh i guess a business mind it's many different sides to that diamond i think I can see already from your answer there how much of a creative thinker you are because for creative minds, it's hard to isolate an individual thing. They actually, from my experience, don't like to be boxed into one thing. Like your answer wasn't, I'm a chef. Your answer wasn't, I'm a businessman. That's why I find it really interesting asking questions like that of creative minds. How do you present yourself When you say meet someone at a dinner party, when people ask you what you do, what do you say? Generally understated, I'm a cook kind of thing or I'm a chef. I generally don't ever say I'm a restaurateur straight off the bat. I'm a chef. And then depending where the conversation goes from there, I think it proceeds or, you know. How do you find people normally respond to that? Generally, most people are really, really perceptive to it. it. Cooking has become very fashionable. Look, we all do it every day to, you know, a degree of whether you're cooking toast in the morning or whether you're cooking your friends a three course dinner on a Saturday night. So I think it's all part and parcel of our lives. It's not very often that someone won't be quite receptive to the conversation. So I think on the whole, generally, yeah, it's generally a good conversation and it snowballs, if you would, into, oh, I've got a restaurant and I've done this and I've done that. Oh, I've heard about that place. Oh yeah, I've seen this and oh, that's right. You're such and such a sister or brother or that's right, I've heard about you or I've read about you or. Yes, I'm interested in that answer because you said that depending on how that answer goes at a dinner party when you like, when you understate it, who do you find is most receptive? What do they do when you present yourself in that environment? I think part of being a chef and part of being in this industry is teaching. And it's something I've always believed. I do a lot of demonstrations in and around Melbourne, both for my benefit at a kind of financial side as well, but mostly because I really enjoy teaching and I really enjoy the 20 years of experience that I have. It's amazing how something as simple as dicing an onion. I remember I did demonstration probably a year ago now and everyone was just like, whoa, 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 can you slow down? And it was like, I guess sometimes we forget things like all of us in our particular trade, what it is that you do every day and becomes repetition. You just don't really think about it. In there, you mentioned that we forget that what we do every day and what becomes repetition. Does that mean that repetition is the only factor that determines our abilities in a particular field? No, I think repetition is at the core of it, but I think also our abilities in a field is also pushing and challenging yourself. You know, my food is super seasonal. It changes sometimes, you know, spring goes for two weeks, sometimes it goes for two, three months. It just kind of varies. So you have to roll with the punches a little bit with mother nature. If repetition isn't the only factor and it's about pushing yourself, how do you present curveballs and pressure for yourself to learn and grow. By changing dishes, so seasonality is a big key. So from last spring to this spring, certainly an ingredient comes back, but the dish itself changes. And it changes in a way that, again, I will seek out a method or a, something that I'm not particularly comfortable with. Don't get me wrong, sometimes too, there are dishes that, you know, we have a Mandarin dish, it's been on two years now here, and it will come back nearly untouched. But that's essentially how I challenge myself and challenge how I develop and grow as a chef. So how do you select that idea or that process that you're going to bring on? How do you come up with a a system or process to apply? And then how do you develop that idea? It could be as simple as something you've read or seen or heard or just in a conversation with a fellow industry colleague. And then from there, sometimes too, it's we're always in our industry, everybody is super hyper passionate about it. 
you wouldn't be in this industry if you weren't. So sometimes it's as simple as, you know, like, oh, I was thinking about doing this with that particular ingredient. Have you done it before? Oh, yeah, you know, we used to do it at this place. Oh, all right, cool. So then they roughly talk you through it and then you go away and jot down some things and then come back the next day and try it all out and go from there. How do you get into a state that allows that flexibility to play with those ideas? Sometimes it can be hard being a, to be honest, sometimes I think back to when I was just the chef and not the business owner. And I think being a business owner, you have to have so many hats. You have to be a chef. You have to be a spokesman, a role model, a figure, a marketing guy, this, that, and the other. And I think back to my last role prior to being a business person, and it was so much easier because it was less to think about. Like even sitting here now, I'm thinking about what I need to do after we're finished because at the end of the day, there's only so many hours in the day and I need to complete everything there. Otherwise, potentially a customer suffers or the business in a small way. It is very, very hard. Sometimes for me, it's especially the more the creative side, it's taking yourself out of the environment. Like sometimes I can be at the swimming pool with my wife and kids. Mm. And I'll be like, brainwave. I'm like, whoa, quick. You know, I'll be driving along and I'll pull over and scribble something down and then go, oh, right. And it's quite funny. I think that my wife now knows what that, oh, kind of light bulb moment is. Gardening. I have a green thumb. I have that coexistence in between being a chef and knowing and understanding where your vegetables come from and where your meat comes from and all of that kind of stuff is super, super important. So yeah, it could be turning the soil or thinning the carrots or doing this or doing that, that you just go like, thought of this amazing carrot dish. Fantastic. Joe, what innovations have you seen in your time in the industry? Being a 20 plus years in this industry, I've seen a lot. I guess the precursor to, you know, molecular gastronomy. The Spanish were using it years, years, years before the English. You know, I'm a big believer in whether it's molecular, whether it's old school, whether it's classic, whether it's whatever. If it's better on the plate, then I will choose to do that. Mm. Is that a combination of your education in London versus being an Australian and bringing that together? Yes, certainly. My schooling here prior to going to London was more classical, was more Italian focused, but going to London and working for the likes of Gordon Ramsay and Phil Howard, it really accentuated that. And then, you know, like, I'm not saying I went every day, but going to the Fat Dark and experiencing it. It's, it, it. I remember it blew my mind. It was like, whoa. Joe, how do you handle competitors? It's a very competitive industry. I always think competition is good. It's amazing as well, I think, how the industry has changed in what I can remember being, for example, the Good Food Guide. It used to be that thin. It was about 20 pages and each restaurant would nearly get a whole page spread whereas now it's encyclopedic kind of thing so yeah competition is massive but i'm a big believer in all competition is good competition and i also believe that being true to yourself and being true to what you believe in terms of cooking and in terms of your customers and what you want to deliver people will seek you out and search you out for that particular thing so in a way i don't believe that anyone can replicate that because no one thinks like i do with that who has developed their brand in a similar way to you that you admire? I think you would have to be really naive as a business person to think that you want to follow or copy or be exactly what someone else is. It's that independence of who you are and what it is. So you're running your own race? Yeah, 100%. The most hated question I think I ever get asked when you do interviews is, what's on trend? What do you do? Do you know what? I don't do and copy what's trendy now. I cook what I like to think is definitely seasonal, but also, you know, in a modern kind of way with my own individual independent spin on it. I really like that answer. Joe, what is your biggest challenge right now? Where are you experiencing the most friction? Our industry has changed, certainly in the last 20 years, where we spoke about how many restaurants there were 20 years ago. But more recently, the advent of platforms like Uber Eats, you know, any of those delivery platform thing has certainly had an impact on the way customers dine out. And also, I actually believe it's going to have social implications down the track. You know, I've got 11-year-old kids and sometimes we might go around to a friend's and they'll have older siblings, 14, 15-year-olds, going out to dinner with friends is 
is sitting across the table and, you know, what did you get done this week or what happened or this or that. They are telling stories, telling whilst sharing food or sharing that experience. And I think the advent of these things has really fractured that. And I think that is certainly a tough thing in our industry right now, paired with economic issues as well. There's a bit of uncertainty at the moment, I think, with the economy and no one quite knows what's going on with it. I think the politicians and the government's not really saying too much. So that certainly had an impact on our industry as well. So what are people doing to adapt in that environment? I think as restaurateurs, you have to be aware of who your clientele are and what they in particular want. Our demographic upstairs here at Saks is the 40s plus era. The kitchen menu downstairs is designed and directed towards the 2240s. That is certainly adaptation there. Just going back to, again, looking at your demographic and what potentially their spend is going to be in relation to particular things that you have on the wine list or the beverage list and then I guess going from there. Doing that demographic research, is that purely a matter of watching what happens in the environment, in the space? Sometimes it is, yeah. Sometimes it is and it's trial and error. It's like, okay, that didn't work and and sometimes it can be a a name brand, for example, wine or something like that or a particular varietal. You know, we are creatures of habit in the winter we like to drink red wine. When it's summer and we're having barbecues, we're all drinking beer. So saying that, you respond with your beverage list accordingly. Ultimately, where do you want to be? In an ideal world, I would love to be able to just, no issue with monetary, to be totally, totally, totally so creative that you didn't have any issues with like, how are we gonna pay for this? Is anyone gonna buy it? How are we gonna do this? All of those realistic things that come part and parcel with running a business, like just being able to be totally creative and not have any of those reins being pulled back on you, not having to worry about money, if you would, is the easy way to put it, (laughs) which is never going to (laughs) happen. It's the dream though. It is the dream. I have one last question for you, Joe. Who would you like to hear on the show? Dave from Embla. He's an amazing guy. He's kind of in my era too, like we're a similar age, amazing palate, good genuine guy, runs a great shop. He cooked at an event I was at yesterday. I won't say the brand, but it was, yeah, it was really interesting to see him present. It was really fun. So I'm going to reach out to Dave. Thank you very much for being on the program today, Joe. It's been incredible having you on. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. The show today was produced by the in-house audio team at Hospopreneurs, led by Jake Olver. Voiceovers were by Angus Brennan. To learn more, head to hospopreneurs.com. Too easy. Beautiful. I know that you're well and truly across the interviews. So uh, how about podcast interviews? Have you done many? Do you know what? I haven't, no. And I have to say that I'm not kidding you. Only, gosh, I reckon it was only a month ago that I listened to my first podcast. I was driving to work. I I was in the car and I was like, crap on the radio. I couldn't get my Spotify to work. I'm like, I'm stuffing. I listened to a podcast. And you're like, wow. I was like, wow. Well, welcome to the podcast world. Thank Um, you. I'm excited. The show today was produced by H Media. If you liked the show, don't be a stranger. Let us know by following now on your favourite podcast app. We'll see you soon.